Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 19, From Friends to Enemies. This episode, I have a new state councillor, his nobleness Curtis, to thank for signing up to support the podcast on Patreon. If you are enjoying the show, please consider adding your support at www.patreon.com forward slash the Russian Empire History Podcast. We have discussed how the Khazars began in an alliance with Byzantium and the domestic economy. In this episode, we will look at their international trade and how that friendship with Byzantium turned to enmity. There is no doubt that Khazaria was a major trading centre. Merchants from northeastern Europe, Rus, Central Asia, Byzantium and Mediterranean Europe came there to buy and sell or passed through on their way to other places. Rus merchants travelled through Itil to reach Baghdad and the Caliphate. The Radania, or Radanites, Jewish merchants who traded across a network from Spain to China and India, were a common sight in Itil. They carried eunuchs, slaves, brocade, furs and swords east, and returned with musk, aloe, camphor, cinnamon and other products. As you may have already realised, almost all our sources on the Khazars are from foreign visitors writing about their experiences. So they concentrate on travelling merchants from their own and competing countries and the international aspects of trade in the Kayana generally. But there were also many local merchants resident in Itil. These merchants would set up their own networks within Khazaria often family-operated, feeding the capital with goods that were then traded on into the Caliphate, Byzantium, or further west into the Mediterranean, where they also had their own offices. Sources report Khazar merchants residing in Constantinople and Alexandria. Naturally, the Khazars were highly active in the crucial Volga trade, sending their ships up to the Bulgars for sable, martin, ermine and squirrel pelts. Their ships also plied the Caspian Sea, which to this day is known as the Khazar Sea in Turkic languages. So it is clear that the Khazars were active international traders and did not merely extract levies from the important trade routes passing through their lands, as has sometimes been presented. The key commodities moving south and east were slaves and furs, with numerous writers citing sable, miniver, fox, martin and beaver being in high demand in the markets of the Caliphate and Central Asia. As noted in the last episode, the Burtasi fox furs from the Khazar's Burtas tributaries were the ultimate status symbol in the Islamic world and sold for huge sums. In the other direction, Although the traditional eastern goods the Radania and others carried were valued, the most important commodity became the silver dirham coins of the Caliphate. But as the furs the Khazars sold came from peoples they had subjected further north, there was also the potential for those people to look for a new route that went around the Khazars, as they also developed and sought independence say from Volga Bulgaria across the steppe to Khwarizma. And as we shall see, the silver dirham hordes found in northern Europe show that this did eventually happen. Khazaria, the Volga, and the region that would become Ukraine and southern Russia was a major part of the slave trade for centuries. The eventual conquest and incorporation of this region into the empire was at least partially driven by the desire to end slave raiding by Turkic peoples. At the time of the Kayanat, 
Slaves were taken, but household servants, agricultural workers, soldiers, building public works, and other purposes. Ittil itself was a major slave market, where according to Isachri, only pagans could be sold, as the Christians, Jews, and Muslims did not tolerate enslavement of their co-religionists. But the greatest demand came from the Khazars' neighbours. Byzantium, the Caliphate, and the Central Asian cities had economies built on slavery and an insatiable appetite for new supplies. The Rus supplied slaves to Volga Bulgaria, mostly other Slavs that the Arabs called Sakaliba. The Khazars raided the Pechenegs, Gus, and occasionally the Burtas. The Pechenegs raided their western neighbours and sold them to the Khazars, and the Madyars were happy to raid their Slavic neighbours and sell them as well. It seems fair to say that at this time, everybody in this part of the world was raiding and enslaving everyone else. Itil was the main market on the Caspian, while Kerch, nominally Byzantine but under Khazar control, handled the Black Sea market. A historian called Thomas Noonan has constructed the origin, development and decline of the Khazars' international trade based on the numismatic evidence, that is, the thousands of those silver dirhams their owners kindly buried across northeastern Europe for archaeologists to find later. The hoards can be approximately dated by looking at the most recent coin they contain. So if there is a coin marked 780, for instance, the hoard cannot have been buried at any time earlier than that. Thinking back a couple of episodes, you'll recall that Khazar-Arab relations began with almost 100 years of warfare, and as you might expect, there was not a lot of opportunity for trade. This changed following the civil war in Islam and the emergence of the Abbasid Caliphate, which already had too much on its plate to try a military expansion north of the Caucasus, and was therefore ready for more friendly relations. Their overtures to the Khazars took some time to bear fruit, and a significant increase in trade only appeared in the last quarter of the 8th century. And that is exactly the date of the first Durham hordes, found in European Russia and the Baltic. The high point of trade from the Baltic to the Islamic world lasted about 250 years. Initially, it came across the Caspian from Iran and Iraq into Khazaria and then up through the Don Donetsk Basin into European Russia and the Baltic. But around 900, there was a switch and the main route for dirhams to Europe became Khwarizm to Volga Bulgaria, and then the northern Russian rivers. There were also fluctuations in the volume of trade, and historians get an idea of this by comparing the relative size of hordes deposited at different times. This cannot be precise, as once the trade had started, there were always dirhams in circulation. But the fair assumption is made that if the size of deposits suddenly becomes much larger or much smaller, then there has been a large influx or reduction in supply. So, 22% of dirhams found in Russia and 16% in the Baltic were deposited in the 8th and 9th centuries, when the trade routes were under Khazar control. 78% of dirhams found in Russia and 84% in the Baltic, were deposited in the 10th and 11th centuries. That is, not only did Volga Bulgaria take over as the main trade route, but the volume of trade also increased quite dramatically. According to Noonan, Khazaria's place in the 10th century trade between northeastern Europe and Central Asia was already falling towards insignificance. A comparison of Central Asian and Abbasid dirhams in hordes across European Russia and Sweden 
showed that Central Asian dirhams, which travelled north via Volga, Bulgaria, made up at least 75% of the hoard, sometimes even 100%. Abbasid dirhams, representing the Near East trade that would have gone through Khazaria, accounted for just 5% and were missing entirely from several hoards. So by the mid-10th century, the period preceding the destruction of Khazaria in 965, the Kayanat was only handling 10% of the trade between northeastern Europe and the Islamic world, with most of the trade originating in Central Asia. If you're wondering what kind of numbers we're talking about here, it's a lot. Noonan puts the flow of dirhams into Russia over this period at between 100 and 200 million coins, with about half of that reaching the Baltic. Looking at periods, in the 9th century, around 20 to 40 million dirhams passed through Khazaria, but this fell to 4 to 8 million in the 10th century. This brought a commensurate fall in the Kayanat's re- revenues, from millions in the 9th century to hundreds of thousands in the 10th. The exact reasons for the shift from the Caspian trade with the Near East to the trade with Central Asia through the steppe is not known, and there are numerous factors that could have contributed. Noonan believes that there was some kind of interruption in the trade at the end of the 9th century. There are numerous large deposits of mid-century dirhams across northern Europe, but almost nothing from between 875 and 900. The Islamic mints were still churning out the coins at their normal pace during this period, and there was no reduction in demand, so it appears that the routes were somehow disrupted. Possibly Pechenegh or Magyar attacks stopped the Rus reaching the marketplace with Islamic merchants. And if you recall from the last episode, there are conflicting reports about how much the Pechenegs were actually under Khazar control at this time. Some Soviet scholars believe that there may have been a civil war in Khazaria. The Rus were becoming more assertive and were likely looking for routes that were not under Khazarian control. Whatever the reason or combination of reasons for the interruption, the response was the appearance of a new route across the steppe from Volga, Bulgaria to Central Asia. The Khazars reacted to the dramatic shift in trade by attempting to tighten their control over the Volga Bulgars and continue extracting funds from them. Until this point, it looks like the Bulgars had enjoyed considerable autonomy, provided they paid their tribute. But in the early 10th century, the Khazars tried to bring them under more direct control. The Bulgar Khan complained to Ibn Fadlan that the Khazars were trying to enslave him. The problem for the Khazars was that within the structures that they had imposed, there was no way for them to collect more than the Bulgar Khan himself was collecting. The tribute demanded from the Bulgars was one sable pelt per household, with estimates of the number of households anywhere from 50,000 to 500,000, giving an equivalent value of up to over a million dirhams. But the Khan collected the same one sable pelt per household for himself too. The Khazars levied their tithe on Bulgar traffic down the Volga. But the Bulgars put the same levy on Khazar ships going up the Volga, and the Khan got his tithe off the Rus and other merchants arriving from Central Asia, who did not go through Ital, and therefore did not pay the Khazars. This trade between the Khazars and their tributary seems to have been based on barter rather than monetary exchange. The Bulgars supplied furs, wax and honey to the Khazars, but we do not know for sure what the Khazars gave them in exchange. A part may have been oil and wine from Crimea. The red clay amphorae from Crimea are found everywhere across the region, and especially in large quantities at saltive sites. Whatever they were trading, the overall effect for the Khayyam 
was that the loss of income was a gain for the Volga Khan, and the political power of the Khazars inevitably began to erode. This shift was reflected across the Khanate. The archaeological picture for the Saltiv culture reflects the same time boundaries. It expands as the trade and wealth under control of the Khazars expands, and peters out in the 10th century as that trade is lost. The trade provided the revenue that allowed the Khan to maintain his standing army of Khwarizmian mercenaries and therefore to enforce Khazar power over the Dnieper and Middle Volga. Without it, his one-time vassals would start to get ideas about asserting their own power. And that's what happened. From the late 9th century, the Khazar's tributaries began to rebel. The Cambridge letter, written by a Khazar in Constantinople, says that Karan Benjamin fought a war at the end of the 9th century against the Pechenegs, the Black Bulgars, Torks, and the Burtas, who were backed by Byzantium. With the assistance of their Alan vassals, the Khazars won. Benjamin was succeeded by Karan Aaron, in whose reign the Byzantines paid the Alans to rebel, and this time, the Khazars defeated them with the assistance of the Turk. In the reign of the next Khagan, Joseph, the Byzantines paid the Rus to attack the Khazars. The Khazars defeated them and forced them to raid Byzantine-controlled parts of Crimea. What made the Byzantines turn on the Khazars and start paying their nominal vassals to rebel against them like this? The Byzantines ran an extensive intelligence operation throughout neighbouring territories, and especially the steppe peoples that they saw as a buffer between them and other potential enemies. Realising that the Khazar economy was in trouble and the Khagan's resources were failing, it is likely that Constantinople saw an opportunity to increase its control over the Pontus. Although it was the diverse and productive domestic economy that was the bedrock of Khazar stability, it was the considerable income generated by taxation of international trade that enabled the Khayans to become a power capable of competing with the Caliphate and Byzantium. The shift in the trade between the Rus and the Baltic and the Islamic world caused this income to fall substantially, which in turn caused a major power shift. The Bulgars and the Rus continued to grow stronger, while Khazaria was weakened, undermining its hold on its tributaries, even as Constantinople looked to use its weakness for its own gains. But is that self-interest enough to explain the Byzantines' about turn from friends to enemies? Didn't we start the story of the Khazars with them as Heraclius' allies against the Persians and Georgians? Indeed. In the early years of the Khayanat, they were very close. In around 700, Emperor Justinian II married the sister or maybe daughter of the Khazar Khayan. Thirty years later, Leo III married his son, the future Constantine V, to another Khazar princess. Their child, Leo IV, known as Leo the Khazar, ruled Byzantium from 775 to 780. At the beginning of the 840s, Byzantine engineers and craftsmen were sent to Khazaria to build a great fortress at Sarkel on the Don. But a century later, the De Administrando Imperio, a manual for Byzantine diplomats, describes the Khazars as a dangerous enemy and lists several neighbouring peoples the empire may approach to fight them. This was some reversal. The relationship between Byzantium and the Khazars was quite remarkable for around 150 years. Crimea is a great example. The Khazars entered Crimea in the second half of the 8th century and soon established full control as the only military power north of the Caspian at the time. Although they appoint a governor of Kherson, the Byzantines' main city on the peninsula, they do not depose the Byzantine administration, and they appear to allow it and other cities on the peninsula to peacefully return to alignment with Constantinople. 
The Khazars established their own city on the peninsula, Sugdaya, now Sudak, as a custom centre for controlling Crimean trade with Byzantium. When Justinian II is overthrown, he is exiled to Crimea, and the new emperor clearly sees no reason to worry about the Khazars using him to foment trouble for Byzantium. When Justinian teams up with the Bulgarians, then enemies of Byzantium, the Khazars kill him. As already noted, the son of Leo III, Constantine, is married to a Khazar princess, which is the first foreign dynastic marriage that is entered into by Constantinople. The wedding coincides, purposefully or not is unclear from the sources, but let's say most probably purposefully, with the Khazar invasion of Transcaucasia, which destabilizes the Arab possessions in the area and allows Constantinople to recover some of its lost territory. Throughout this period, the Khazars were Byzantium's closest allies and fought for it against Persia, the Arabs and the Bulgarians, and then they suddenly become enemies. So what happened? Although the Byzantine sources are absolutely silent, the reason seems clear enough. The Khazars adopted Judaism as their state religion. We have two versions of the conversion story, which can be seen to have been revised over time in the sources to add legitimacy. According to one version, which is presented in a letter from Kayan Joseph, the rulers of Khazaria asked for experts to present their case for why they should convert to Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. Emperor Michael III and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Photius, chose as an envoy Constantine the Philosopher, a scholar we have already encountered under his other name, Saint Cyril, future inventor of the Glagolitic alphabet. To avoid confusion, I'll just call him Cyril. Cyril travelled to Khazaria, stopping in Crimea for a year to learn the Khazar language on the way, and arriving at the court in 861. His mission failed, and the Khagan chose Judaism. The alternative story is that the Bek had a Jewish wife, who persuaded him that he was a Jew, and then he forced the Khagan to convert. In Constantinople, the response was a campaign of forced conversions of Jews, which was followed by further campaigns, which are directly linked to the Khazars in Byzantine documents. These forced conversion campaigns then ceased after the collapse of the Khazars in 965. The shifts in the power balance within the Khaganate we discussed earlier in the episode, not so much with the Volga Bulgars, who were far enough away from Byzantium not to matter directly, as with the loosening of control over the Pechenegs, Rus and Madias, reduced the value of the Khazars as allies. There was little point in Constantinople carrying favour with a buffer state if that state was not buffering it. But this alone cannot explain the sudden 180 degree swing from close alliance to outright hostility. According to the Genizar letter, an anonymous letter from a Khazar merchant found in a collection of Jewish manuscripts at the Ben Ezra synagogue in Old Cairo, the Khazars themselves saw their conversion to Judaism as the reason for Byzantine enmity. So let's take a look at the Khazars' conversion to Judaism. The contact between the steppe and the Islamic and Christian worlds, both with their official religions and pretensions to universality, raised the issue of official religion in the steppe empires also which had the potential to be a very important issue, given the multi-ethnic, multilingual nature of the steppe confederacies and the need to ensure loyalty to the ruling clan, especially as missionaries became more common and conversions among the people became widespread. Although Zoroastrianism came from the Iranic descendants of steppe peoples, it does not appear to have been followed by any of the steppe empires. Different peoples did, however, 
at various times, convert to the other universal religions, Christianity, Manichaeism, Islam, and Buddhism, as well as Judaism. These conversions were usually motivated by sound political reasoning, and they nearly always involved the elites adopting a religion that had already become widely practiced by their followers. From the point of view of the sedentary periphery, there was also a competition to convert the heathen barbarians to their religion, and therefore ensure that they remained on the same side. Byzantium and the Arabs both sent missionaries into the steppe to attempt to convert the nomad empires. Similarly to the Byzantines allying with the Pechenegs against the Judaized Khazars, the Arabs attempted to increase ties to their vassals who were more inclined to Islam. Ibn Fadlan, the Arab writer whose name has come up a few times, was passing through Ital on his way to the Volga Bulgars to persuade them to enter into an alliance with the Caliphate. This did not always work out as planned. The Caucasian Albanians sent a bishop to the Khazars' nearby tributaries, the North Caucasian Huns, who from their leader Alp al tabir son-in-law of the Khagan, down to the riders of his army, all happily converted. The mission was declared a success, but the following raising season, the Huns attacked the Albanians again, and they continued to do so. The Alans initially converted to Christianity, but later they changed their mind and sent their Byzantine priests packing back to Constantinople. These were subordinate peoples, though. The Khazars were one of the first dominant peoples of an empire to convert. Out in the eastern steppe, the Uyghurs had already converted to Manichaeism a couple of decades previously, and the Bulgarians, who migrated to the Danube, would convert to Christianity soon after. The Khazars followed religious practices widespread among the Turkic peoples. They chiefly venerated Tengri, practiced certain shamanistic rituals, sacrifices, self-scarring, funeral games, and other pagan practices. There was an ancestor cult, and certain trees and caves were treated as sacred. Cyril described his meeting with the Khan, who summoned him to advocate for Christianity. He writes that the Khan declared that they knew one God, who is above all, and they bowed to him in the East. At dinner, he raised a toast to the one God who created every living thing. Here is most likely talking about Tengri, a sky god who was the supreme ruler of the Turkic pantheon. Ancestor worship was particularly displayed in the burials of the Kagans. Upon the death of a Kagan, everyone with him would also be killed, including foreigners, such as a Byzantine official in 711, who was killed along with 300 soldiers. The Kagans were buried in extensive mausoleums, and all the people who worked on the construction were also slain. The grave could not be approached on horseback, highly significant for people who would do everything from the saddle, but had to be approached on foot with regular prostrations. Arab writers have also described the ceremony around approaching the Qur'an. When the Beg, the half of the ruling diarchy that did the practical work, approached the Qur'an, the half that embodied the divine mandate and sacred elements, he would prostrate himself and wait until summoned. When summoned, he would approach humbly, barefoot, holding a piece of wood. After greeting the Koran, he would light the wood to purify himself with the fire, holding it until it burned up, and then take his seat at the right hand of the Koran. Alongside these traditional practices of the elite, Christianity and Islam were being adopted by ordinary Khazars. Armenians and Georgians brought Christianity, and archaeologists have found a large number of churches in areas controlled by the Khazars. Mercenaries, artisans, and traders who took up residence in the towns brought Islam. Arab writers describe Samandar as largely Christian, and Crimea, which had been under Byzantine domination for a long time by this point, was naturally largely Christianized. There is evidence that steps had been taken 
to establish a wider church structure in the region, with episcopal offices covering the Volga and North Caucasus, reporting to the Metropolitan of Doris in Crimea by the late 7th century. Historians have noted that shamanism and traditional religious practices of Turkic and Mongol peoples originated during their time as hunter-gatherers in the Altai and Siberian forests. On the steppe, the change to a pastoralist lifestyle was also accompanied by a weakening of their traditional religion. Some argue that they were already tending towards a monotheistic religion centred on Tengri. This may have made it easier to impose a new religion onto the existing framework, without actually resulting in widespread changes in day-to-day practices. For instance, it seems to take a couple of centuries from alleged conversions for changes in burial practices to take hold. The conversion of the Khazars has been a subject of controversy for centuries and raises a number of questions, most of which we do not have clear answers for. The first would be when, where, why and who, that is to say, which Jewish people did it. The last one might not be quite as straightforward as it seems. We might think of the Jews as a distinct nation practicing a specific religion, an ancient one dating back to who knows when, as related in the Old Testament, one of the sources of Christianity. But that was not entirely the case. The Judaism of Jesus' time was Second Temple Judaism, a religion singularly focused on the temple in Jerusalem, the second of its kind, built after the return from Babylonian captivity to replace the destroyed temple of Solomon. This religion required sacrifices, which could only be made at the temple to which all Jews were required to travel, as the Gospels relate Jesus doing. There was not complete unity among the Jews. The Jewish-Roman historian Josephus, writing in the 1st century CE, records four schools of belief. But in 70 CE, a Jewish revolt ended in the destruction of the temple, causing a crisis in Judaism, as the key rite, sacrifice at the temple, could no longer be performed. It took a couple of centuries for rabbinical Judaism to fully emerge as the replacement for Second Temple Judaism, And although it became the dominant form today, it is not universal. One of the other forms is Karaite Judaism, a movement that some claim descends from the Sadducees. They recognize the Torah, but reject the Talmud, the codification of commentary on the Jewish law that is central to rabbinical Judaism. There are several theories on the origins of the Karaites, including that they formed as a reaction to Islam. But wherever they came from, by the 7th century, they were quite widespread, accounting for perhaps as much as 40% of Jews, and they had communities in Transcaucasia and Crimea. Later, in Cyrus times, the Karaites of Crimea would successfully persuade the Russian government that their community had appeared in Crimea before the time of Jesus and therefore they had no share in the supposed responsibility of rabbinical Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus, and so they were freed from some of the laws oppressing the Jews of the empire. So with the Karaites present in Khazaria, there has been some debate over whether the Khazars converted to rabbinical or Karaite Judaism. And right through to Soviet times, many in Russia have regarded the Crimean Karaites as descendants of the Khazars, a subject we will return to in a later episode on the legacy of the Khazars. The conversion story in the Genizar letter, where the Khazars are described as being Jews who had lost their sacred texts and practices before recovering the Talmud from a cave in the Caucasus and returning to rabbinical orthodoxy, has been interpreted by some to indicate a competition between Karaites and rabbinical Jews. However, modern scholarship has reached the consensus that the Khazars were rabbinical, and there is some evidence for hostility between the Khazars and Karaite Jews. The 
the question of when the conversion took place remains more controversial. According to the story in the Cambridge document, Jews from Armenia arrived in Khazaria in the very early days of the Kayanath. They mixed with Khazars and only preserved some elements of their ancestral faith. Later, a prominent military leader began promoting a form of Judaism closer to the traditions, which angered the Muslims and Byzantium. This was the trigger for the invitation of scholars to debate religion. Following the debate, which the letter does not describe, Jewish books were brought from a cave and explained by the sages of Israel, which resulted in the Khazars completely converting to Judaism. Jews also began migrating to Khazaria from Iran, Iraq and Byzantium. This story has been interpreted in a couple of ways. First, as a way of uniting Khazar believers and Jewish immigrants, who may well have had different practices. Second, as a way of backdating and legitimizing Judaism as a belief for Khazars, with the vestigial Judaism without the traditional books and sages being a way to tie traditional Khazar religion with a more or less monotheistic tengri to Jewish practices. The letter from Kayan Joseph provides a different version of the conversion story. In this one, the Khazar Beg Bulan receives two dreams from heaven telling him to go to the Kayan and persuade him to convert. He did so successfully and then, instructed by a third dream, led a raid of Azerbaijan to raise funds to build a temple. At this point, the Muslims and Byzantines send missions to persuade the Khazars to a different course of action, but fail. This is described as happening 340 years before Joseph. A few generations later, under Obadiah, there is a renewal of the faith and a strengthening of Jewish traditions. Both these stories seem to indicate that the conversion was a process rather than a sudden event, and historians have theorized that a Jewish influence began among the aristocracy around 730-740. However, when the Emperor Constantine married the Kayan's daughter, Chichuk, in 733, the Kayan had certainly not converted. Through to the end of the 8th century, we do not find Byzantine or Arab writers referring to the Khazars as Jews. Judaism seems to have spread in the early 9th century, culminating in a full conversion around 840. The first reference to the Khazars as Jews comes soon after, in an Italian text contrasting the conversion of the Bulgars to Christianity and the people of Gog and Magog, in this case the Khazars, converting to Judaism. By the time of Cyril's mission in 860, Judaism seems to have been well established, and some scholars have interpreted his description of the mission as indicating that the whole debate had been rigged by the Jewish participants. This could be seen as aligning with the version in the Genizah letter that Muslims and Christians increased their officially sponsored attempts to proselytize the Khazars in response to Judaization. Given that everything beyond the actual conversion seems to be a matter of sparse evidence and educated guesswork, I'm sure you will not be surprised to hear that there is also a range of opinion on how deep the conversion was too. Surveying writers from the period just after our proposed conversion date in the mid-9th century, there is a very broad range of opinion. The Persian geographer Ibn Rusta says that the Kagan and the aristocracy who, quote, sympathize with his inclinations, profess Judaism, while the rest follow a faith similar to that of the Turks. Ibn Fadlan, in contrast, says that the Khazars and their king are all Jews, although, as already noted, he was passing through to the Bulgars in hopes of building a Muslim alliance against the Khazars. Persian historian Ibn al-Faki writes that all of the Khazars are Jews, but they have been Judaized only recently. Al-Masudi, the Herodotus of the Arabs, says that Ital contains Muslims, Christians, Jews and pagans. The Jews are the Kayan, his entourage and his tribe. The king of the Khazars converted during the caliphate of Harun al-Rashid, 
He reigned from 786 to 809 and has been joined by Jews from Islamic urban centres and Rum, that's Byzantium. This was because the king of Rum converted the Jews in his kingdom to Christianity by coercion. Istakri writes that the smallest group are the Jews. Most of them are Muslims and Christians, except the king and the people of distinction. And as I quoted in the last episode, Arab geographer al Muqaddasi says that Khazaria is a difficult land full of sheep, honey and Jews. So there you have it. Anywhere between a very small number of aristocrats and the entire nation of Khazaria converted. But everyone agrees that the Kagan was Jewish. We have no indications that the adoption of a state religion, or at least a religion of the ruling tribe, had any effect in terms of imposing uniformity or ethnically integrating Khazaria. The Rus, Bulgars, Pechenegs, and other subject peoples continued with their own religious practices. Indeed, they may have even chosen them to oppose the Khazars. Ithil had its Christian and Muslim quarters. This was much like other steppe empires, where we have seen that the rulers did not have a problem with their subjects having different beliefs, as long as they maintained the correct subordination and did not contradict any taboos. The conversion to Judaism does not seem to have changed anything in Khazar relations with the Islamic world, which as we have seen was already fairly hostile from the beginning. Although the wars ended, and there was considerable trade, it appears that they never really became friends. Relations with Byzantium was where the conversion had the greatest impact. But here again we are forced to speculate. For Byzantium, the failure of the mission to convert the Khazars seems to have been seen as such a major loss that it could never be mentioned again. Sources referencing the Khazars become scarce, and we have to judge the change in relations based on recorded events rather than any expressed opinion. The Khazars were friends, and then they became enemies. Jews were tolerated, and then they were repressed. But without better sources, it is hard to speculate how much of a role the conflict with Byzantium played in the eventual collapse of the Karyanath. Much has been written about the role of the Khazars in the formation of the Jewish communities of Eastern Europe, both by people looking to them as their possible ancestors and by conspiracy theorists and chauvinists using Khazar as a euphemism for alleged Jewish, or at the very least non-Slavic, forces controlling Russia or as the opponents of Slavic development in the neo-Eurasianism of Gumilyov, more recently espoused by Alexander Dugin and Vladimir Putin. We will look at this in detail in an episode on the legacy of the Khazars. Next episode, we turn to the other peoples in the Kaganat and begin looking at the development towards statehood of the Slavs, the coming of the Rus, Volga Bulgaria, the Pechenegs and Magyars, and the eventual fall of Khazaria. That episode may be a week later than normal, as I'm thinking of taking some time off with my kids in the winter holidays starting next week. But in the meantime, you can look out for the second members episode, Argim Pasa to Zoroaster, Early Step Religion, coming soon, which you can access by subscribing through Patreon, Apple Podcasts, or Anchor. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them on the link in the show notes or on the website at www.therussianempirehistorypodcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or by email to hello at therussianempirehistorypodcast.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.